recording. Okay, so I'm recording this for anyone who misses this live, anyone who wants to join the team. By the way, I talked to Luciana Asinari today from the Fab Lab Network, the coordinator of all the Fab Academies. Uh, it was a good <coughs> conversation. She um, uh, is going to try to put some more people our way from the Fab Labs Network as far as potential instructors. So we'll see if that comes out. Ferdy, I know you know her, so... Um, that's good. So, as far as can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, normally, they have these topical talks. So once a week, there's like a talk about something. Uh -huh. um, we had like all kinds of people um, talking about all kinds of things. Uh -huh. You could ask her if you might be one of those um, speakers. Oh, interesting. That's a, that's a good point. Um, it's a talk between who? All the Fab Academy instructors or? It's you talking to all Fab Academy students. Fab Academy students? Yeah. I see. So that's a little different than we are right now. Is, um, but this, this session is not in session right now. So is it right now or that's, is that later when the actual Fab Academy starts? Fab Academy only starts in end of January. So there's still plenty of time to organize this. I see. So basically during the Fab Academy uh, to present about this? Yeah, there is a talk once a week. Mm -hmm. We had um, oh, all kinds of people, like people from um, the Salt Systems talking. We had people like, how's this, um, Freddy Goodjansen, like uh, one of the most known artists, um, talking about his ideas on Fab Academy. And mm -hmm. we had people from Autodesk, um, people from uh, McNeil, from Rhino. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure they would be very happy to have you there. Um, and this would be, you could also try to get Fab Academy students to dedicate their Fab Academy to open source ecology. Oh, that would be cool. Um, yeah, that's definitely some. So I'll, I'll ask, so ask Luciana about that. Yeah, okay. definitely. Um, um, I think the person to talk to is, is Neil himself, but. Um, I, I can I can poke around a bit and send you some stuff that might help you. What's that weekly conversation called during the Fab Academy? I think they call it topical talks. Um, topical talks. Give me a second. Weekly talks at the Fab Academy. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because that means also the. Oh no, they call it. Um, uh, they call it recitations. Fab Academy recitations. Yes. Okay. Is that what? What is that like? One hour talk or how long is that? I think it's an hour and a half. Um, I sent you a link to the schedule from last year, uh, from from this year's um, Fab Academy. And you see that every once in a while, there's um, written recitation tools, recitation projects, recitation version control. And for example, on version control, oh, yeah. um, you can also watch the video and you get an idea of what it looks like. And like I would usually just turn on the video conferencing system and put this talk and whoever's in the classroom can like listen to it. I see. And that means the instructor, so most people listen to it live during that time, or do they like listen to it afterwards, or? Yeah, if um, the ones that are in the classroom, they will listen to it, and um, I guess the ones that missed it, they will um, watch it afterwards. Mm -hmm. That means also all the instructors get to hear that too, or no, or they don't listen to it? Yeah, the instructor, it's always very interesting. Like, I, re I really like those talks. I, I always follow it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, yeah, we'll definitely uh, think about doing that once we kick into the season in January. Uh, January 15 is when Fab Academy starts? It might be different from year to year, but usually it's um, end, of, end of January. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, this year was January the 16th. Um, okay. Well, good, good. Looks like we got a full house here, so let's, let's continue. So, um, yeah, 
definitely it's good to so far so far to year a fab academy grad and, and definitely fab academy people probably anyone who's an instructor will have more than enough knowledge to teach what we teach or at least pick it up really quickly as far as what we're trying to do at the steam camp so let's let's go through the steam camp curriculum just start with an overview but basically so we've got the way we look at it is the first four project days and then no four like core boot camp days and then five project days so let's talk about the four days since that's the big deal and I think we're pretty good on day one which is the 3d printer um, getting the tool chains around 3d printing which we have the d3d simple we've built it already so it's so for the the preparation that's still required right now is going to be pretty much like productizing it in a way which means that we prepare kits for all the instructors and for all the students we've not done that so this is really about a kit that we can also offer to other people as well not just for the the steam camp but as a product that we we have in our open source everything store day one is pretty good so day two uh, day two is the circuit plotter uh, so we're looking for a manual to see if there's an update on that Emmanuel are you on today Sorry, circuit plotter. That's that's Ferdy, but Emmanuel is uh, he's designing the the Arduino that can be done with the circuit plotter. So um, I'll I'll get to you guys, but let's just keep keep with the overview a little bit. So on a day three is the electric motor slash uh, CNC mill attached as a third head to the to the universal axis. And I think a good name for the universal axis in this instance would be the so we called it D3D Simple. D3D stands for Distributive 3D Printer. Like distributive is the keyword for open source ecology. But how about uh, D3D Universal? Because that has more than uh, D3D Simple. We called that. That was the 3D printer that we did. Uh, that was a simple printer. Maybe we call this D3D Universal. It's we can decide on what exactly we want. But I think D3D Universal may may be a decent name. Uh, so. Day? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so day three was the. We, it seems like we're in good hands with the uh, electric motor, and we'll we'll hear from from Michel on that. Uh, so he's also done some of the instructionals on generating WebGL beautiful explosions from FreeCAD using Blender to WebGL that's explodable within a browser as a universal file format. So that's awesome work. And then day four just. Talk to Saulo, Saulo, I guess how you would say it. Saulo, how do you say your name? Yeah, it's like this. It's something like this. It's Saulo. Saulo. Uh, yeah. He's joined from Barcelona. Uh, so he's looking into the the electric the electric battery pack and towards the universal welder. So that's the um, we're not far on that yet. So we'll see if that materializes or how far we get on that. So that's four days. Um, I think uh, we're good on day one. We'll see how we're good on like day one and day three. I think we're the most confident at at this point. Let's hear about day two and four. Now we also have a bunch of intersprinkled power electronics in there, like uh, the welder controller. That's one we talked about a light dimmer, and then we talked about uh, in the curriculum. You can kind of see it in there the power supply for the electric motor, but the, those three could be a universal power supply that we combine those three projects into one more universal one. So when I was thinking about how we manage this crazy curriculum, is I think we can generalize the power stage that the that universal controller runs, so that we can have have it be also the charger, like the battery charger. We can have a scalable welder power supply, battery charger, light dimmer and electric motor power supply because pretty much the same components you're basically rectifying ac and then switching it fast with a signal to turn it on and off really fast and then you can control the voltage in dc from 0 to 240 if you've got 240 input i mean we think um maybe emmanuel can tell us more about that but basic switch mode power supply that you're just turning the signal on and off really fast to get the voltage that you that you need and for for rough brute force voltage that seems to work if you're not talking about powering like fine electronics with it but instead just like power hungry devices like welders or motors i think that would work so we'll see uh, but that's a way to combine all those electronics into that one 
uh, nice universal power stage that will hopefully be made with our circuit plotter um, and so forth. So that's the overview. Now the second thing I want to bring up is also um, what I'm thinking for, and I want to get all your feedback, who wants to come here November 9th through the 30th. So I was thinking of doing like a like an open source microfactory uh, startup camp or product camp, like something where we're actually kitting up, kit, kitting up, productizing some of the things we have. So that would be like the D3D Universal. It would be possibly the regular printer, possibly the torch table. So I'm actually building out, we've got a prototype of the torch table. I'm going to get that running because I want to get that cutting steel for things like the shredder and uh, filament maker and then tractors and brick presses next year. But um, I think it would be a nice idea to to do the product camp or startup camp where we're focusing on a product uh, deploy like deployment, productization. So it would be around the micro factory where we've got 3D printers and other machines, but also products of those like like Chris's headphones or 3D printed wallet or other yeah, stuff. Wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have it? Yeah. Show, show us. Yeah, show yeah. Us what you got. I have the, the, the TPU one anyway on me. Uh, the TPU I do actually um, like it a little bit more than the, the polypropylene, though they're both pretty good. Um, I mean, it's one of my favorite too because it's a, a lightweight and it's also super lightweight. People ask about it in comment, and not even knowing it, having added anything to do with 3D printing, it just looks cool. But also, is a nice, uh, super useful. Um, yeah. Right print, no assembly required. I mean, printing in GPU is difficult, but it works well with semi-flex stuff too. So, anyway, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> that would be awesome. So, yeah. so the idea of a of a product camp, three weeks. Now it gets cold here, so we'd have heat in a hab lab. I mean, a hab lab is pretty decent to go. Right now, I'm using a hab lab uh, for my print cluster, so I'm getting that up and going. So, so if that if you guys were to descend on here, we'd have uh, probably around 10 or so 3D printers. We're going to have four small ones, probably two medium ones, 12-inch bed. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to do this in the next couple of weeks. But I have the six-foot tall one that I want to get running, and I have the th the three-foot by three-foot printer that I want to get uh, running too. Uh, six foot tall. Uh, no. Six uh, tall using an eight inch bed, so it's a, just a very big thing. So uh, combining the one inch universal axis with the eight millimeter universal axis, but you know, this is time. Like if we're talking about the open source micro factory, I've got to have a good one here, and and that could perhaps be uh, the grand opening of the first ever open source uh, micro factory in Maysville, Missouri. So that's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm thinking, but but that so why would you guys want to come? Well, I think uh, I'm thinking we can do development on uh, stuff that's related to Steam Camp, like the D3D Universal, which means a lot of integration, including the electric motor and everything. Uh, so that would be a lot of stuff around there. A lot of this could be around documentation, making videos. So I, we would want to invite a person who does video, do instructionals and other assets that go into marketing, like even like web, web page templates that any one of us, so this is all open source. So, you know, we can embed it on OSC, you can embed it on your whatever with our nice uh, 3D WebGL as the uh, product, uh, like visualization and stuff like that. So, so basically three weeks of getting products out into the world uh, to start making economic impact and starting to print wallets, man. And then <laughs> printing money. <laughs> alongside with it no we gotta do we gotta do um i think there's a lot to be said for simple products like uh what i'd like to do also yes. yeah um for example so i'm doing um by the time you get here i'm gonna have like right now the next two or three weeks i'm gonna have the industrial grade step up of the printers meaning fully enclosed chamber you can look at that high temperature heated enclosure uh, the, for the concept, let me let me just paste that in. But I'm, I'm going to implement that in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's called high temperature heated bed, actually. So let me paste that. Um, very simple concept, if you can understand it. But basically, a guard on top that keeps a super hot chamber up to 178C, where everything is outside of it. 178C, people. Did you hear that? That's 
that's serious industrial production that you can do anything in that including up to peak and PEI 3D printing so um, I'm gonna mark that as a note but if you take a, that, that's the concept but the idea there is if you have something like that you can print thin things out of things like ABS which you can't print really you can't really print with ABS without a heated enclosure uh, you can't print with uh, polypropylene though Chris says you can but w when we say can that means you're using the heat of the bed for the pseudo heated chamber really but once you get off the bed everything starts to crack and fall apart so we're talking about if you have the heated chamber then you can build whatever even thin, very thin things that actually stick together don't fall apart I remember we tried to print a, a leaf eliminator for our gutters last year we ended up printing in PLA started with ABS but it just totally fell apart after you get off the bed like an inch totally falls apart you can't print with ABS using regular printers um, so that's funny like that's that's the insight I'm kind of seeing it's like a printer really prints in maybe Chris you can correct me on this but a, 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 an unclosed 3d printer can print only in PLA and TPU can it print anything else uh, PTG, I've uh, got had good success with PTG with that enclosure. Yeah, yeah, but that's but that's it. So that means with with the enclosure, you're talking about taking that to the next step, which is missing in the 3D printer world because that patent is actually expiring right now. But we're not infringing on that patent because we're doing a different thing. But the heated enclosure chamber patent, nobody does it. Uh, so we're going to take the next step. Um, so that's the plan here, and we could have access to that. Uh, I don't see why this wouldn't work, so I'm going to get busy over the next few weeks. But I was going to also open that up to the public so that if there's people that want to contribute to the documentation and build out and get like the first access to um, this kind of an immersion experience, I was going to open it up as a public event. So that's the idea. Um, what, maybe we can start by saying, what do you guys think? Like, would anyone want to come? So Chris, uh, you mentioned you could potentially I know um, Michelle yeah for at least, uh, at least for a portion for a portion of it that's it could be possible now getting away for that much time would you know for all of that time would would likely be difficult but uh, yeah. Yeah. okay for a block of time you know uh, wherever it makes the most sense or what be most maybe at the, at the beginning okay uh, what do you guys think of the idea is that good or is that putting too much in on a plate We'll see. I think um, we have to keep track of, of developing the Steam Camp and getting some products out. So I think this would help. So I, you know, I think it would be good. Okay, but let's let's go into the, some of the technical discussion of where we are on more of the curriculum. So maybe um, Chris, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So. Um, uh, on the 3D printer, uh, we're working on uh, final production-ready hardware. Uh, basically, I took the code that, that uh, you, you know, fairly slow and free cash. So, can you? Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty much, much documented in my in in my uh, in this Google up here. But most of the free CAD that I've done, which I haven't committed yet to this, to the I'm going to be sending it back to. Uh, uh, William, I think, or uh, um, but, but it's, it's the uh, extru um, the final fit on uh, on the, the simple extruder c uh, components. Uh, basically, as I was uh, just trying to replicate it here, I, I noticed that some of the parts weren't really coming um, fitting really well together on uh, some of the otter like NEMA variant kind of motors. So I just basically did some fitting on on those components um, with the. Uh, we just need to make sure that everyone can print out all the parts and that they're all going to fit together uh, with everyone's different tolerances. Um, the, real, the, the next thing that really needs to be uh, finished on this for this part of the printer to be basically done with, uh, for the curriculum is to integrate, um, uh, it's a little bit of wire management that I'm wanting to do from the top of this and then basically how it's going to be attaching to the, the carriage. Um, so that might be uh, talking about the universal um, uh, ad uh, uh, adapter, uh, tool, tool head uh, attachment, uh, which, 
Yeah, yeah, I guess it applies uh, yeah, to the rest of the curriculum as well. I'm working on a, 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 um, a simple mechanism that I'm trying to see if this is going to be a, a one way of attaching the, the tool head to the, to the, to the carriage. How does um, that work? So what this is, uh, is it, uh, just with the hardware, I'm actually waiting on MasterCard parts so that I can use the same hardware uh, in the other pro projects that we have. But it's a, it, basically it's two washers and a captive uh, a screw. It would be a, probably a shorter one that we would use eventually, but I uh, took the space in, in between on the universal carriage and just basically put these slide in, slide over, click out slots. Wow. So um, I'm a little bit, uh, uh, well, I'll need to test a couple of things. I mean, uh, I thought it was going to, to work well and um, basically, basically one, I want to be able to use the same, it would be cool if we could use the same mechanism to attach both different pull heads to the, uh, to the yeah. print exit or different beds to the, to the carriage. Uh, um, Access. I, uh, I noticed that in, so in some designs we have it where the extruder is you know, side, uh, front mounted on, on the axis, and then the D3D thing noticed until I looked closer at the pictures, which is I've never actually seen a, a print head running on a on or on an axis like this before. Um, but you know, same mechanism we should be able to get to get to work. Uh, so basically, yeah, as you can imagine. Hmm, uh, that's nice. Right. Push. Basically, it is you push in. Slide over, click out, and that would hold everything. Push in, slide over, click out. Uh, oh. Yeah. So I mean, right now it's it's um, my main concern is rigidity and getting all of this so that I mean, it, ideally it's going to use the same spring as as the tensioner uh, and the same screws uh, you know that would uh, elsewhere uh, in the machine or in other projects. But the, the trick will be getting it so that this there's no play um, in in like this. But it, it, if that it's the case and can get it, get it rigid enough without having to do any tensioning. The idea is that we could take a tool head off, you know, unplug the stuff, everything's plugged in together, unplug it, take it off, put a new one in, plug it in without any tools. Um, yeah, so th that's, this is the main thing that I'm working on. I just hacked this in, in really quick blender this morning just to have a, a, a working, you know, to, to thing. Uh, but then uh, uh, going back and getting it in into the FreeCAD code um, is what basically I'm going to be working on over the next week. That's awesome. I like the I like the idea, man. That, if that works, that'd be awesome. Huh. Awesome. So, awesome. Then I'll yeah, go forward and try it. I wanna so I wanna ask about documentation, like uh, files. Like, yes. Can you upload like immediately to the like as soon as you got something, either like to Google Drive or to the wiki. The wiki is limited to one uh -huh. meg, one megabyte for files. But uh, if you okay. upload things in chunks, like parts, then that's fine. Like. For example, mm -hmm. if you want to save an assembly, you can save the parts, and then when people download it, they can just merge all the files together. Uh, so that mm -hmm. so for everybody I on the team, please use embed the Google Docs. Like there's a template. I don't know if I uh, if you guys seen a template, but what works well is to to keep track of all your graphics and writing, like pictures and stuff in a in a Google Doc that you can edit immediately. And embed that into your wiki, like on your log. So first of all, start your log, like Chris log, Martian log, and do that. Embed the Google Docs. Upload the files immediately. Like I'd like to see, for example, Chris mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, like you know, uh, upload it so I can mess with it. Uh, you s are you using Blender? Sure. Um, so I'm using Blender and FreeCAD right now. I'm using FreeCAD for I'm using Free uh, FreeCAD for the fi um, changes I'm wanting to I'm trying to commit back uh, for the for, for the curriculum. Basically, I want all the finals of everything to be in FreeCAD so that that everyone else will be able to modify and and, and use them too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they'll they'll merge well with with everything else that's going in. The only thing I'm using Blender for right now is like a scratch pad sketching and to do a quick experiment. So I didn't want to go through and try and engineer this whole thing in FreeCAD. Uh, it, you know, what took, well, 20, 25 minutes in Blender is probably going to take me a couple of days in FreeCAD to get to, to figure it out as I'm still, as I'm still learning. Uh, so anyway, basically just test and then um, do the final, the, um, the final implementation in FreeCAD. Now, do you want me to upload my Scratch Blender files Please. as well? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, do so. Yeah. And I'll just put everything into my own Google Drive um, and then I'll, I'll put links to it on in my log. Does yeah. that work or do you want to do that? That With works, it? yeah. Links is the easiest. You can also do, the other thing we do is galleries. Like, for example, uh -huh. um, let me share my screen for a sec. But the gallery, uh, so for example, um, 
well, go to gallery template. So if you go Yeah, it's just gallery is the link is. So if you look at under the code of the I'm gonna paste it there. So it's in the chat box. So you see a gallery, so that's just a template. So go into edit and copy that and then uh, that's how the code looks. But see, like with the Google that Google um, Drive stuff, it's like there's a whole bunch of files. It looks like GitHub, you can't tell what's what. But if you put a little thumbnail to it and like put the file right underneath it, like so this is what it looks like. Uh, the thumbnail is in there and it, it draws these little boxes um, for you. So you can look at the picture and then you can immediately see what's going on and that saves all the other people a lot of time. So you don't have to wait through a bunch of files. The gallery is very useful. Um, yeah. So try to use it. Um, so you see, like, if you just keep copying that, you can. It goes to like six lines and then. Yeah. Blah 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 like that. So you can see how it looks. Like that. You just you know. So for each file, that's the most thing. I know it takes time, but try to do it because it helps other people to get up to speed really quickly on what you're doing. Okay. Well, that's yeah. great, Chris. Uh, so keep going on that. Let's see. Because uh, if you upload those, like, keep working in your Google Doc. Like, let me see. This is your Google Doc here. Like, um, I added some comments about the, yeah. the wire mounting. Like, how do we do a, a really quick disconnect? Um, yeah. Do you want to say a comment on that? Because the shooter has got, like, 15 wires coming from all together when yeah. you cut everything up. So we're thinking yeah. of like, a, what do you think of a terminal block and then like an interface? Like it's a specialized think, circuit, but what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And yeah, to say that specialized circuit, I mean, uh, I, I feel like that yeah, um, is absolutely the way to do it. I mean, definitely we have to have a break, all the wires break away all at the same point, all really close to the extruder anyway. Um, so already you're going to have everything come to a plug and then either it's going to go into another yeah, cable um, with just an, or like an interface more like this. Um, so the reason I was bringing, I'm bringing this up is because I'm doing lots of different repairs on, uh, um, on, on machines. Uh, I'm basically have to run all of my machines for in, basically into the ground. Uh, um, so finding all the different points of what breaks on the printers the quickest and more than half the repairs I do is on a gantry cable because uh, any uh, stranded, uh, um, you can strand it, all wires will eventually, one of the 15 wires will eventually break, uh, with the highest longevity being in this sort of FFC cable type of a weird flex flat cable. Um, Do you have any so idea yeah. for how long, like, the, even, yeah, like, say I've got Cat5, even if you got, like, really nice bend radius, you think that'll break yeah. after some time? Um, maintaining really, yeah, perfect bend radius, uh, would definitely reduce the, the amount, uh, you know, or, or increase the longevity of, of the cable. But I still think that, I mean, it would it will eventually it wouldn't last as long as this. I've, um, yeah, like I said, on every uh, every printer design that, that doesn't use one one something like this, I've seen it eventually burn out after some, you know, uh, uh, not you know, good long lifespan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that could be good. Like maybe maybe like. Um, you got a good source of them. How much are these cables? They are kind of expensive, uh, but they are they're able to carry a lot of current and, and a lot of uh, 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 signals. I think this even has twenty. I think this one has twenty-four. Um, Gauge twenty-two. I'm, I'm, I'm counting the. Uh, I think it has twenty-four uh, uh, pins. Uh, but uh, what is yeah, that twenty-two sure. gauge? Because we kind of need 22 unless we double up. Good question. The... I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, as um, I can see... Okay, so if we go to... Like from the extruder, we could go into... Um, this gets into technical discussion, but I mean, do we want to go from the extruder like into... Like a terminal block? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I was looking at, at the ca at the cable or the connectors that you were, that um, the MTA uh, a connectors that uh, can um, be quickly assembled, um, and yet some sort of board uh, that just has uh, uh, that has uh, input for this that can break it into whatever uh, sort of more generic cabling that, that we're wanting wanting to use. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
this stuff also, uh, um, even though it, so it bends really, really well around this axis, obviously, um, and not so much around other axes, but I've seen you can, in order to get it to the right place that you want, you can fold it, uh, give it like a sharp fold like this. And so that's basically how I see um, these cables wind their way around uh, um, in order to get to the place where it's going to have a lot of repetitive motion, and then it just does it like this. Um, well, how do you terminate it? Do you need special tools or no, it's just, you just need a plug? I've seen it always go to is surface mount plugs. Um, now that is where I've seen these things fail as they go in and they go into this little uh, uh, fragile surface mount clip. Um, and then different, sometimes there's tape, sometimes there's glue, sometimes there's a clamp that tries to hold this actually in, but that's where these things actually will get slowly pulled out of their uh, thing. And uh, when that happens, they can, they can burn out. But can you this, put a, uh, yeah. can you put a connector on it without any tools or you need tools? Yeah, no, this plugs right into a circuit, uh, um, um, a, a circuit, a circuit, circuit thing. Connector, it, it clamps open, clamps shut without tools. That's cool. Um, yeah, I've seen there's so even ones. Yeah. So you would use a, a clamp that, so you take out the bare cable. The cable does not have a connector on the end of it. When you disconnect it, you take out the bare cable. No. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. Actually, I probably have a clamp in the in, in a box back here if you want to give me a minute. I'll, I can find it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any comments about the cabling structure here? I thought that th that thing would have a plug on it. Um, the cable FC, FFC cable would have a plug, so. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe that. So. I'm still trying to find the, the name of the connector. Um, we used for, for our interchangeable heads, we used two um, six pin connectors. So for the simple bounce extruder, it was just one connector um, for the fan and for the four poles of the, but the one connector, um, I think was enough for some, I think for the milling machine, also one connector was enough. Mm -hmm. And then so got when necessary, wires here. Yeah. yeah, so this would be 12 wires out there then. Yeah, I, I tried to find the connector and, and post a link. Yeah, uh, but for you guys, what I found was MTA 100 connectors are these things that you slip the wire right in. Only problem is you have to have this kind of a punch down tool, which is like 25 bucks. But otherwise, these tiny connectors for 22 gauge, so I actually can show you one on the 3D printer. Um, put my stuff on Facebook, I embed Facebook. And, but um, recently I posted... To show you like on a how tiny these things are and you can still get the wire in there perfectly so i took 22 gauge let me try to find it here um 22 gauge wire look at this thing okay so no maybe this one right here that's the mta it's a very tiny thing. That's like Cat5 cable wires there. Uh, you punch them in, and you don't have to do anything. You, you just punch them down with a tool, and that's it. And then you put on the white cover. So that's the tool. Expensive little thing, like 25 bucks for that. Uh, so here's the details. That's with the clamp on it. Um, and that thing is so tiny. So if, you, if we get out of there and go to where it's actually used... That connector is that one right there. It's the one that goes, actually, this this one is the other end. That's Cat Cat 5 22 gauge. And that's the other right there. See that thing with a white cap on it? That's the MTA 100 connector. 100 means the same spacing as the 0.1 inch headers. That's why it's called MTA 100 for 0.1 of an inch. That's the 2.54 millimeter spacing. So, for the Europeans, that's the MTA254 connector. But that's, that's an example of it. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is actually, this is a, a board that uh, I pulled off another printer that basically, uh, it has this connector, as well as um, the... Yeah. Uh, 
and it just converts it back in, into a ribbon that then plugs into the extruder in this case. Um, in our case, if, if we wanted to go this route, is this um, thing just flips up, cable slides in, and then it flips down and, and clamps. Um, is that reusable that way for many times, or is it just meant to be done once or a few times? Oh, yeah, uh, many times, because uh, this is a cable I, I also do replace. Um, but yeah, again, because it, uh, it it clamps here, it is, um, and then there's usually a clamp a clip over it to try and hold it down and in place. So these these mm -hmm. definitely would last a lot longer. And I was just thinking about um, though it, because it does add this extra complexity, we'd have to build a circuit, a little an extra jumper board on every axis that's going to be moving, um, maybe two if we wanted to convert it back into Cat five for or other cables for uh, running elsewhere or to the main board. So because of that extra complexity, we could probably get by with not doing this in the initial um, spec of the, of the machine, but uh, like you were saying about t strategies of, of reducing the kink in a cat fiber cable or something would be good for like six months worth of, of, of you know, could be six months worth of printing before it, it broke, but uh, I wouldn't imagine it would last a year of constant printing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Michelle, yeah. you're pointing out to this other Tussling CNC, that's the optical, right, from Good enough cnc.eu, which toss link that's getting way more complicated, right? That's optical transmission. You're squeaking like a mouse. Uh, Michelle, you're squeaking, squeaking. I think you have to <laughs> you have to shut down, shut down, and reconnect. Um, Toslink CNC, interesting. Yeah, uh, that's the good enough, uh, good enough CNC which got aborted. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I've been using the good enough CNC, and I, I think he's called Musti. Like I, I know the inventor. Um, yeah. Like we, yeah. Um, we made one of those machines work. Um, we had some problems. We were losing optical steps. Um, I, I was going crazy trying to figure out what's happening. And then it turned out um, we were losing optical steps, which I had never had before. And after like fighting for a week with uh, with those optic converters, which are supposed to turn on a light if they um, miss a step, um, which didn't happen, I ended up ripping out the whole optical system and doing it the good old analog way. Right, right. Um, I think this is that's above our league right here. Um, the system is quite interesting because it allows you to um, uh, circumvent all the noise that you would like, for example, using a plasma cutter or something that generates a lot of right. electrical noise. Right. The and the uh, optics don't care. Right, right. Uh huh. Michelle, did you want to say something or? Uh, is my sound better yeah, now? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it just seems interesting uh, to reduce the amount of cables, uh, but uh, I didn't look into it that much, so it's nice to hear the feedback. Yeah. Maybe we should stay well, with the classic approach for the moment. Uh. Yeah. Well, it's not about, uh, you know, that you're always going to need a cable. The question is basically how to connect them. We can't get away with, mm -hmm. I mean, right now we can't get away with less than the 15 unless we use some common grounds, but that might save us like one or two. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. just got a large number of things. Okay, so we'll keep working on that. Um, I, I mean, what I'm going to do, go ahead. Uh, so, um, for sure, the, the, whatever uh, signals and power that's coming across this line has to power not just this tool head or the two tool, other tool heads we're talking about, but uh, potentially more tool heads in the future. Um, do we expect uh, cable requirements for tool heads to, to be many more wires than this, or do you think the extruder uh, is probably about as many signals uh, yeah. and stuff? I've never that. seen more than 15. I mean, that's for now, yeah, yeah that's plenty. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh-huh. So what I'll do right now is when I build out, so I want to build, the, I'll build another of the D3D simples, the, or the D3D universals. I'll, I was thinking of doing the Cat5 route with the MTA100 connectors just to see how well that, that works and, and how benign it looks. But um, on the printers that I've had here, like running for months, pretty much nonstop, I mean, the longest ever was just non-stop three months and nothing happened to the cables at that point yet uh so 
I mean, we'll we'll see. I, I think it's acceptable, but yeah, if we talk about multiple years, yeah, I might, uh, cables might wear out. Okay, so let's move on. So, um, continuing on to Freddie, do, do you have any updates on uh, so the plotter? Yes, like uh, unfortunately, I had a good bit of bad luck. I was so happy that I managed to assemble all the printer and plotter in FreeCAD. Um, including all detail without crashing. Um, and so I happily switched back to Linux and up upgraded from um, to the latest version, which um, messed up my system. So now I'm <laughs> unable to do anything useful. But by the, by tomorrow, I should be able to upload some files and show you. OK, uh, so you haven't uploaded the file yet anywhere? I I'm still a bit like uh, unsure about where to put which files and how to name them. So I right yeah. now I'm putting them on my own GitHub. But if you could have a little talk on like okay. what can so, I upload on the wiki? How do okay. I name it? it would be yeah, great. yeah. So to clarify, um, nomenclature uh, the number rule number one: use your work log. And as soon as you have a file, like pretty much 15 minutes after you've started it, just upload it. Don't worry too much about the name use the as much of the naming convention as possible like for example if this is d3d simple or d3d universal use that and if it's d3d universal the whole thing call it that if it's the d3d universal power supply call it d3d universal power supply and so forth there's a a taxonomy page on a wiki actually uh, let me uh, show you that it's called taxonomy so this is I'll paste that in, but basically the the, the concept is that there's 500,000 pages on the wiki. Not yet. There's only 10,000 right now. But 500,000 is what it would take for the entire GVCS. And, and with this methodology, you can find any one of those 500,000 pages within seconds. So read through those five points and understand. But basically we break things down into module. We have a, the number first thing is like for naming, machine naming convention seems to be most relevant right now. There's an official list of names, but since we're working on things like the D3D Universal, that's not an official name because the 3D printer is an official name. So for now, just just do whatever name is most appropriate. Uh, and then break it down into the modules as much as you can. Uh, this, this point three here shows mostly the modules as uh, related to the 50 GVCS tools, the main ones. Now versioning, that's a, that's an important one. If you just name it anything, but get the versioning right, then you, you can survive and without crashing the entire system, meaning that people will be able to find it. So for versioning, simply name it like, right now we're at 19.10. So 3D printer V19.10, if that was the version that we're developing right now. We don't have a 3D printer V19.10. The last one is 1906. Uh, but basically name it name underscore small v and then the year point month. And if it gets, if there's more than one version, then start going by point day. Like the 14th or the 7th of uh, October would be 19.10.7. So this is critical because what, what happened in the early days until we implemented this was people would throw up files and then um, you don't know which is which. So you absolutely need the version number. And the simplest way for versioning, like Ubuntu does it, just use the year and, and date uh, and month and day. Why? Because that g gets you oriented with how old that file is right in the name. So don't use like V1 or V2 that doesn't tell much about the temporal history so just use this kind of a convention um, then <clears throat> development spreadsheet that's the last thing you would want to know but uh, that's like the 20 items like the simple spreadsheet has 20 items in it the 20 things that you need to know like requirements industry standards conceptual design modular breakdown 3d CAD calculations electronic design wiring and plumbing software BOM CAM files, cut list, build instructions, and so forth. They're just basic things. Um, most relevant are 3D CAD, BOMs, build instructions, build pictures, and video. Why do we include uh, modular breakdown? That's, I want to emphasize that. Modular breakdown is important because we can divide 
things into modules and then you can work it in parallel. So, so if you break the, your thing down into modules, you can start delegating it to other people, but without breaking it down, you're, you're not able to do it. That's the basic on taxonomy. But the summary of that is, go on your w work log and 15 minutes into any file, just upload the damn thing. And if it's too big, because we only accept up to one meg, put it somewhere else and and instead of uh, don't forget to put a link on your log to that so whatever happens use your log upload the file um, ideally you'd use the gallery as I mentioned before so that it's it's a nice visual representation of the history uh, and the notes are I'm taking these notes like the gallery um, so wiki taxonomy should go into the notes for today and then gallery was the gallery template so you can follow that but yeah just get that up uh, and also on your you notice on your log like for example Ferdy log you've got the timesheet right so use it um, just write down don't worry about writing too much like detail what you put because that should be in a in a textual description in the wiki which is searchable if it's in there like if we put it into there like we lose it it goes into another platform so you can't search it so just put the tasks and hours so you keep track because this all goes into the overall developers graph which is uh, I can look at that but that's that's where you are right now like last week we had nine people uh, keeping track of hours for a total of 150 hours of development time last week um, so that goes all for tracking for overall project uh, okay so Freddie I look forward to seeing some of those files because we got to see did, did, uh, how'd you do did you, you think you got something going on or or you how close you are to a design of a of a plotter attachment Freddie do we lose you it's like we lost Freddie do we um, Okay, I'm not seeing Ferdy, but um, so he's. It seems like he's getting good progress on a plotter attachment. And Emmanuel, are you here? No, I don't see Emmanuel. But Emmanuel is working on a keycad design of what you would draw out with a plotter and then etch it, where the etching happens in a bath of copper chloride that's agitated on a bed by the bed moving back and forth so it's a little agitation so that's actually a good thing because that will help it uh, to etch properly um pretty uh, uh the question i had for you if you're back was how do you think you're doing on a plotter like what's its status how, how, how much complete do you think i'm sorry i just heard plotter. i was offline yeah. for a second right i want to ask you what do you think is the estimated status of completion for the plotter how much do you think you got i think by tomorrow, I should have something I can I can show. Do you think the thing works, or it's it's like first draft of a first draft? <laughs> Do you think that's gonna work, or or? Uh, I think it's gonna no work. Idea? Yeah. Okay. okay, it's gonna work. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, yeah, upload that to your wiki. I'd love to see it. Um, anything else on your side, or any other questions? Um, have you given any I thought have, about I have a lot of questions. But maybe this is the wrong point in time. Okay. Um, maybe let's go through everybody first and then maybe go back to your questions. Because the okay. thing that we need to consider, like integrating the the mount, the universal axis, the carriage mount design, like Chris was showing, we want to use the same one ideally for all of them. Or, I mean, so that the tool head, you can attach it um, to the carriage using the same kind of a mounting system or a system that is just plug and play that just comes right on and off uh, where the question is like is there any interface point on top of the axis the the carriage piece or does it attach to the carriage as is exactly um, actually I want to show that just some concepts um, For the carriage attachment, I just had some simple mechanical attachment, and Chris kind of did something completely 
different, which I like though. Um, but in Steam Camp specifications, there's a page called Steam Camp module specifications. Let me type that in. I'll put that as a note into the meeting. So universal toolhead connections, like by the way, so this is like try to write up any more ideas regarding the Steam Camp module specifications. So feel free to edit these docs here talking about wiring and uh, here's the mechanical, let's see, where's the mechanical attachment? Yeah, so that's talking about the plugs. Here's, uh, yeah, here's concepts of quick, quick attach using non-modified carriage. So just put something around that that would have like maybe like an eccentric lever. So you basically like this this thing around the carriage side, side view, would be a thing that contains your tool head. So maybe use something like that. Well, that's just one idea. This, this has not worked out yet. Well, we have to figure out how to mount all these things um, on the carriage. Now for the, what I'm seeing for the electric motor what I would like to see probably is the motor is slung right underneath the carriage because then it's most balanced. And because it's a flat pancake type of motor, it would fit best at the underside as opposed to off to the side or whatever. Um, so I'm thinking maybe for the universal motor, perhaps build in an attachment point on the on a, on a end of it away from the shaft so it could be turned into a mill. Um, so that's, yeah, take a look at that page if you want more for ideas. Um, okay, Michelle, can we come to you, your updates on the motor and everything else? But you're, sorry, you're, sque you're squeaking again, though. Maybe come in and out. You're still, sorry, you're still squeaking. I don't know what's what's going on to you. You're still, still squeaking, man. Maybe, maybe a refresh. I don't know, a refresh or shut, shut your computer down. I don't know what you did before. Okay, that's no, better. There you go, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what's the matter with my computer. Um, I've been focusing on the tutorials the last few days. Uh, I want to finish that up uh, in the next uh, at least two days. Maybe I can upload the, the Blender parts today or um, at least tomorrow. And then I still have to do the. Um, the web part so I've, uh, I was starting with uh, um, winding the coils but I didn't get further than that for the moment so uh, yeah first I want to finish the tutorials okay let's see but for the pictures if you haven't seen let's see do you have any pictures of the coils there or uh, no not yet no okay. What you do have the latest on there is, wow, so you got two two instructions, so you're working on the third one? Yeah, uh, and the fourth one, both. So uh, the, the parts uh, to use the add-ons in Blender, and then how to um, test it locally with a, a Python server, and then how to put it on HitLab or GitHub, and how to embed them in the wiki. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, I was working on the Blender part, and for people who aren't used to Blender, Blender has a, a pretty steep lear learning curve. How do we get so, around uh, that? Yeah. Well, I, I'm adding uh, an intro with just the functions you need to select the parts and uh, 
how to work with the viewport and things like that. Uh, so people don't have to watch any other uh, tutorials before they can start with, with the add-on. So uh, that's why it's taking a bit longer because I, I want to ha make that basic instructional of using Blender. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's good. That would be great for. I haven't used Blender much at all, so maybe I could learn. Well, <laughs> it can be pretty confusing because, uh, like, uh, just like selecting uh, selecting a part is a. Uh, uh, left clicking in the viewport, but if you use the outliner, it's right clicking, and uh, it can be pretty confusing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you should start with the latest version of Blender. Um, uh, since 2.8, it's um, normal right, right and left clicking, and it got a lot easier. Yeah, I know, but the problem is the API in 2.8 has changed, so the add-on has to be modified. And not only that, um, I'm working, still working with um, the 3GS JSON exporter uh, because that was like easier uh, to uh, add extra information to the 3D model and things like that. And mm -hmm. it, it doesn't support it anymore. For the uh, 2.8, uh, the JSON exporter isn't uh, supported, and now they're focusing on using uh, GLTF format um, so yeah if we're transitioning to 2.2.8 we have to rewrite the the add-on we have to rewrite the hmm. whole concept what's what version are you using uh, 2.79 but it works in, in a 2.76 uh, up until 2.79 but it stops there if we're going to 2.8, yeah, that's that's quite a lot of work because uh, then we have to go to uh, mm. uh, GLTF. That's uh, another format. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and for people who are looking, so you do have a picture of one of the coil. So you have a coil winding thing, just a thing on a on a drill, and you just use that. Yeah, that's. Um, um, and in the original tutorial that uh, I'm basing that work on, uh, it's made in wood, so I made a 3D printed version um, to wind them. And also, um, he just uses tape and then winds the coil onto the tape. And I 3D printed uh, the, the the small um, uh, coil winding things. So it fits snugly into the uh, the stator. Yeah, and back so, uh, of, right back of the envelope calculations indicate like I was getting like 83% efficiency, but I'm not sure if those calculations are correct. Um, where are those calculations? Um, that would be where are they? I forget. Remind me. Where to put them. I, hmm. I can't remember. Um, um, hmm. That should be. Yeah, I have to look it up myself. Yeah, that would be clearly and um, okay. Not important right now, but but eighty three percent is really good for a starter thing. And then it seems like if we make the coils not circular but more like elongated or like rectangular. That should make them more efficient. Is that your understanding, Michelle, too, or no? Uh, yeah, probably, probably. Because, uh, and yeah, I've I've looked into some uh, automated coil winders, uh, open source models, and using them, it shouldn't be a problem to uh, use whatever shape we want. Because yeah. there were some examples, round coils. Uh, more square coils, or uh, you can make more triangle-shaped coils, I suppose. You just uh, have to calculate the circumference, uh, what the length is, so you can uh, uh, put that in the variable. Yeah, well, that's that's for the future. That's for like optimizing. If we have a good, uh, decent working motor, that would be really good. But with the cooling fans, we shouldn't have a problem with any overheating, or anything like that. Okay. Um, who else do we have reporting on 
any product. Uh, I have to leave now, so have a great meeting. Okay. So. Thanks, Michelle. Yep. Uh, I think, let's see, Ferdy. Thank you. Had, um, anyone else have anything else to report in terms of actual uh, designs for the first four, four or five days? Because then, if not, we can go back to Ferdy with questions and things. Yeah, Ferdy, maybe maybe go ahead and we can. Uh... Yeah, I just have some just very general remarks. Yeah. Like um, on the Steam Camp, yeah. um, what do you think about um, instead of doing it all in like one yeah. block of nine days, um, right. doing um, uh, nine blocks once a week? That could that could work, but that means yeah, you got to be there nine times. So yeah, but Chris, you. Yeah. Oh, I had I had put something similar as um just just down as I was doing some kind of uh, thinking on the uh, on on the curriculum and, and also the other people who'd be involved in, in running logistics as well as as the target uh, client base and uh, you know that many days in a row is a pretty big is it yeah. is is a pretty big ask for a lot, for a lot of people. Um, I understand though and the value in uh, having momentum going. So I was think I had put something along the lines of like. Uh, for one month, three, four weekends in a row, you know, weekend, 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 and then extra long weekend, or maybe extra long weekend, and then weekend, 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 or something like that. Uh, we have a couple of days in a row, and it's eat for a time where you don't forget anything. But but one of the things that that, yeah. that was appealing to me, that, other than some simpler um, logistics, is the, the value of homework, that people can take the printer home that they built the first weekend oh. and continue printing, continue working on the designs, and continue thinking about how does this apply to the rest of my life? What is else going on? And then come back with more, you know. That's a good point. Huh. If you could assign homework like that, there's, it just extends really how much we can we could do in the same amount of time. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would help people. That's a, definitely an advantage. Um, and for the first camp, like if it's in, say, in February, January, February, it's it is tough for anybody in January to, to get there's no vacations there, uh, so yeah. maybe. Uh, I mean the intermediate there is like, so yeah, weekends definitely are doable, right? So maybe like first iteration, just do like five weekends, maybe sh even shorten it down to eight days or something, uh, four weekends, so it's a month, um, and then we can cover like the first two two days. The second two days are pretty exciting. Then we start on a project, build it out, and then the last two days we maybe have enterprise development. Maybe that would be. Um, yeah, yeah. Definitely doable, and definitely in the summer. Yeah, we can do nine days because eighteen people showed up for nine days uh, in July this year. So that was that works in the summer. But yeah, we'd have to either like select it for the spring breaks, which are throughout March primarily. Uh, so all of March is almost game. But then again, that's I don't think spring breaks are nine days. They might be seven days. Um, maybe we could offer like different. And a lot of schools, a lot of schools stagger their spring breaks around here anyway. But all the spring breaks are slightly different. They are. Yeah, they're over like I think from late February to like whenever. But yeah, it's like over five weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can definitely entertain um, as we get closer what the real option ends up to be. Um, Ferdy, anything else? Yeah, I'm still trying to collect my thoughts. Um, Awesome that we have the tutorial for doing the, the, the web version of, of everything. I think mm -hmm. the, um, how's it called, the, the web, WebGL, the new format, mm -hmm. um, not, yeah, it's, in the end it's WebGL, but it's the NGLTB format. And this exports quite nicely from Blender, but I, I guess the problem is that it doesn't have the explosion function, so to say, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No explosion function. So all of us like try to follow Michelle's uh, on his log. Michelle log. Follow his tutorial. Yeah. See if he can replicate it because we we want to yeah. generate some of these things for all of our stuff to make it super easy to explain. 
even like on a cell phone where you can just you know view it in a cell phone so you can have CAD viewability that's complete um, uh, and only other thing I want to bring up now is um, any ideas on other people who can be potential instructions instructors and in potentially creating curriculum here basically the idea that contribute a little bit to the curriculum and we teach you the rest kind of deal learn it all together uh, but uh, Ferdy uh, any your fab lab Academy people that you might think or anyone else think of anybody else that we can bring in because we are it's gonna be a bit of work to do the, all the documentation and it's always about how good you know the quality level of this we're gonna get it as good as possible um, any ideas yeah not yet I guess everybody's also busy with Fab Academy which is a very similar program right um, I bet most people are also um, waiting like to like oh yeah this is the first first year let it run, see how it goes, and then maybe next year we join. That's right. I mean, that's the kind of response I've been having. There's, you know, I talked to so many people and made some good contacts, but look how many people we have, like six or so uh, from like, a, like probably like 200 uh, contacts or so. Um, really low turnout everyone's like no i this is too hard i ain't gonna do it sorry <laughs> sure. uh, i mean a lot of people actually said like yes yeah, i'll buy your kit and i'll take your course but i can't help you develop it you know so <laughs> so a lot of people sounded really excited about the product but when it came to to the actual work that takes to get there everybody stepped out <laughs> except for us here so uh, that's how it went um, I, I saw your, your interview with Tom Lipton, which yeah. is awesome because I'm a, I watched a lot of his videos. Yeah. Um, um, I thought about maybe if you just like, you could send him a brief, which would be cheap for you and it would be a nice souvenir for him. Because uh -huh. I think he also has these, um, you know, these weekly um, shows where he shows like presents that he gets sent. So he um, uh, just presents all the little gifts he gets. And okay. if you present a brick with a, and, and says like, yeah, so this is open source ecology, they're still looking for helpers. Okay. I think he has a lot of subscribers. Yeah, yeah. Um, send a brick to, to Tom Lipton. Um, and since this is the whole crew was like this old Tony and um, I'm a, a host, the other guy called um, Tom um, Lipton. YouTube. Yeah, if you get to the YouTube community, I think this is going to um, ring the big bell. Yeah, yeah. And I did go to all these people from YouTube, but man, nobody. Well, so Tom Lipton has 100, one, 111, one, 111,000 subscribers. So that's like, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, that would be definitely cool. He's a primarily fabrication guy, all custom, like t making tools and stuff pretty cool stuff uh, a person like that um, he's good on on the hardware stuff but he wouldn't be able to do the CNC so much um, but maybe we could do, do programs which are maybe like one or two days on different topics but let's wait till then for now I think the main idea is okay let's get that collaborative literacy where we actually start generating the crew of people that can collaborate on open product development so that's like the first thing um, yeah, I would send a brick to um, you know this old Tony or D Resta. This old Tony. Yeah, or th there's this whole group of um, like C um, NYC CNC. Like they, they recently or Adam Savage. Like they made a um, a collaboration between a lot of makers in, in the states and building something for. Uh, they, they rebuilt the hatch of the first NASA module, and there's maybe 20, 30 makers in there. I would send a brick to each one of them. Mm -hmm. So you say this old Tony and who else? The Resta? Or if you look at um, Adam Savage's, there was a, a um, one episode about building this hatch from, from the NASA module. And he collected maybe 20 makers that are able to machine stuff for rebuilding this NASA thing. I can send you a link. Mm -hmm. This old Tony, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, still, there's people, you know, still looking for people. Um, Saulo uh, joined today. He might be able to do do work on the battery 
pack, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's also Julieta from uh, Switzerland, interested in collaborating. But yeah, just kind of uh, not as many as I, I would have liked. Uh, but it should be really good, so uh, let's see what we can get. You know, continue on through this month and then see where we are and, and how we can streamline this curriculum. I think it's gone okay. Um, could definitely use more help. Let's see where we are um, in a week or two. So um, I'd say, yeah, let's continue continue developing and then maybe let's check in. Uh, maybe, should we check in like maybe next in a week or just to tech, technical development or so? Yeah, let's check in like maybe, let's make it maybe like Thursday at noontime. Thursday at noon is working well, well for me personally. This works okay. So Thursday noon for next time. Um, yeah, great. And Ferdy, I look forward to your stuff. Maybe Emmanuel, I don't know why he didn't show up. He uh, Maybe he's got the circuit mill going, uh, the circuit etching, the Arduino Uno design. But yeah, so thanks a lot, guys. Great work. We'll continue on this and look forward to the first camp. That would be awesome. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take care. Great. See you soon. Take care, guys.